Yes. <laughs> it's always uh, an interesting one as it tells me we're going live here. I'm not sure if we're quite there yet or not, but I think. You think? I think we're live. <laughs> good. Okay. Very you need good. To have we'll a little, just... You need to have someone to confirm it for you. You know. So you we'll we'll wait this. for um, a few people to join us, and hopefully we'll have a, a crowd interested this evening. But yes, there we go. We are doing well. So uh, thank you both for, for joining me tonight. Uh, and thank you to our viewers uh, for uh, uh, coming on as well. Hopefully 7.30 on a Thursday night, you've got a, a cup of tea at home and you're able to sit back and be titillated by what will undoubtedly be an interesting discussion. Uh, we're joined this evening by uh, Melissa Lee, who is a National Party MP based in Auckland and is the spokesperson for broadcasting, who will uh, have a very interesting insight, I'm sure, given, uh, Melissa, you are a former a broadcaster yourself aren't you indeed yes, former okay. journalist former broadcaster media person very good and uh, and we are also uh, joined by the chairperson of the uh, new zealand council for civil liberties thomas beagle so thanks for joining us thomas hi everybody uh, so tonight we're going to be um unpacking uh a number of big issues, like you said there, Thomas, so we'll kind of take them as they come, but there's kind of three uh, main aspects, and the first is the review of harmful content and censorship, which uh, was announced uh, last year, uh, middle of last year, actually, uh, um, Minister Jan Tanedi, the Minister for uh, Internal Affairs, is reviewing it, but there's been a lot of um, speculation, a lot of secrecy around it, we're not really sure where it's going. Um, at the moment, there are six components of the censorship regime that exists in New Zealand. Uh, Melissa, I wonder if you could unpack for us, um, kind of as it's your portfolio, what is the current regime in place that oversees censorship, censorship in New Zealand? Well, I guess we have different, different government entities, well, actually independent of government, like the classification of us, but the Gentinetti is actually um, internal affairs. So that technically belongs to another spokesperson but um, right. uh, if you have specific questions that you'd actually like me to actually answer I'll be happy to I mean we've had some uh, real issues uh, this past week with uh, you know the censorship office potentially um, speculated or uh, people were suggesting that um, um, the um, a particular film was going to be banned in New Zealand which a lot of Indian community actually took uh, issue with and I had to clarify what was actually happening on my Facebook as well. Mm. So, you know, Kashmir Files is the movie and it got a rating of classification of R16. And, you know, there were um, some concerns raised by a certain sector uh, who actually felt that um, the film may potentially um, have people um, um, hurt as a result of, um, um, you know, um, seeing the film, um, violent attacks against the Muslim community, for example. And uh, mm. so the classification of us, uh, the chief censor was looking at it again. I know for a fact that I spoke to him on the weekend when, when these concerns were raised with me and I rang him directly and spoke with him and he was speaking with the stakeholders um, to um, look at the issue and uh, was going to come back uh, whether uh, it was going to be reclassified or whether it was going to remain at R16. Uh, for the record, I think um, it has a different classification overseas. It has been um, um, it has been released in other other countries uh, with R18 classification. So mm -hmm. we were we were a little bit um, less concerned about the film, obviously. Mm. So th that's really interesting. You're pointing to the role of um, one of the officers, uh, the, the chief censor there, and uh, the FSU has also been engaged in that particular conversation uh, and been in dialogue with the chief censor. And so th that is all kind of one of the pillars of our uh, content regulation regime that we have here. Others are the Broadcasting Standards Authority, the ASA, the Advertising Standards Authority, um, the Harmful Digital Communications Act comes within that. You know, there's a number of different features that are at work there. But as far as we can tell, what's uh, being proposed in, in, well, what is under review at the moment and what could come out of it based on some of the comments that we've heard is a real restructuring of the regime. At the moment, it covers public comments, uh, but public comments of you know designated commentators not uh individuals thomas i guess uh, from uh, your perspective blogs 
podcasts, uh, social media. Th these are things that have kind of come online since the regime was set up in the 90s and, and includes really different forms of communications, maybe than what the regime was initially intended to deal with. From your perspective, do you think uh, online speech in public forums, but of private individuals should uh, be required to meet the same thresholds as, as what we require from an advert under the ASA or a radio station under the broadcasting standards? Well, I think you've hit it. One of the big problems of it is that it is so wide in scope mm. that you can say anything about it. I mean, they talk about content being any communicated material that, that is publicly available, whether it's written by you know a, a business or, a, or an individual or so on. Um, and having this idea that and we can review this entire structure from a from a blank piece of paper and come up with a whole new regime from it uh, to be honest it seems quite far-fetched to me I, mm. I really can't see them getting very far on it i think but, also uh, yeah if i could actually just jump in i think the issue that we have is a fragmentation of the regulations i mean you've got the bsa you've mentioned that you've actually got the media council you've got the censorship office um, classification office and the thing is that you know media has actually changed uh you know broadcasting standards authority can only do broadcast material it can't really uh do things that are actually live streamed even though it actually originally broadcast on terrestrial television for example mm -hmm. it's the same content and yet if someone has a problem with it they cannot go to the broadcasting standards authority um, um for you know uh, complaints for example and the media council you know um it, it's not a government entity you know which particular media do they and and it's a membership based thing so those uh media that don't belong there uh, for example, there'll be a lot of ethnic media that actually are not part of the media um, uh, council who people may not be able to actually get any kind of judgment on um, content, for example, you know, mm. and classification office literally um, doesn't do anything to do with broadcasting, you know, it's, it's about film and literature, right? So absolutely you, you, you're addressing kind of the the different functions there and and the uh the roles that they play and, and and really in a technical sense that's very important but even in a more philosophical sense um you know should we be holding individuals who are expressing themselves to the same standards that we would a a, a broadcaster or, or an advert you know uh, of course a swearing is prohibited um on on, on most um in, in most content through the broadcasting standards authority are we well, going yeah, but, but part of the problem with that, of course, is that the whole idea of being you're you're a publisher and you're an individual or whatever is actually getting blurred itself. I mean, what is a podcaster? Mm. What I mean, what are you doing right right now? Are you an activist? Are you a, a journalist? Um, what are you? Is this a public forum or is this just us people chatting and people happen to be watching? There's all those big questions, and it's like there's this huge spectrum of stuff which didn't exist before, and I think we might be trying to apply. We think we can just come up with a new twist on it. Mm. We just need to tweak things and we actually redo things, but uh, we can actually we can actually achieve the same sort of things. And that's what I'm a bit skeptical of. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, Thomas. You you kind of uh, bang the nail on the head there. Really, in that, in my opinion. Uh, censorship and the way we deal with online communication and what what, what this forum is nowadays that exactly we don't really even have the right words for it all the time but how we uh, engage with this and, and create rules around how we uh, dialogue within it is one of the most difficult public policy questions I think we're facing at the moment with all the competing interests and you know as the free speech union of course uh, we're dedicated to a very particular foundational right within that our, our friends at the Council for Civil Liberties you guys are dealing with a whole number of competing interests there it's really complex and and one of the um the aspects of that that has emerged even more particularly recently is are these notions of uh, of misinformation disinformation malinformation there's a whole iteration of uh, of different forms of communication that come through that uh, melissa i wonder can you help us unpack what some of these different terms are or what are they trying to uh delineate there well, I guess I, I think most people don't understand the difference between uh, the three. I mean, it, it is sort of, you know, it, it's in the same class, but it is actually of different uh, um, things that actually happen. You know, uh, misinformation, obviously, you know, uh, someone um, potentially by mistake giving the you know wrong information is misinformation. Uh, for um, Disinformation is, you know, um, purposefully uh, misleading someone 
uh, I guess, malinformation is, you know, when, when it actually becomes harmful as well, you know, by using information that may be um, technically true, like, for example, revenge porn, or, um, you know, true facts about myself that is actually uh, distributed, but um, uh, with the intention of actually hurting me or hurting my reputation. And I think, you know, people often do not um, realize the difference, but I, I, think, I think we need to sort of go back to this whole thing. I mean, you know, New Zealand has, the world has actually become uh, such a place where people uh, nowadays talk about, you know, fake news. Uh, if they don't agree with it, it automatically becomes fake news. Mm. Um, and, you know, and it's about it, not necessarily it, it may not be the wrong information, but they just don't want to hear it because they don't they don't actually agree with it. And the cancel culture has actually, you know, um, propagated all over the place where people are not willing to debate topics like in the case of you know, the film that I actually talked about. You can't cancel history historical um, events that have actually happened, whether it's actually comfort woman from Korea that, you know, the Japanese actually took around, you know, Asia, you can't, you can't cancel Holocaust that actually happened. And I mean, and films and depiction of history is a creative outlet by a filmmaker. And you can actually only, you know, sort of look at it from that perspective and you can't sort of say, well, this is wrong history. Well, it is the filmmaker's version of the history and it is creative arts. And I think sometimes people sort of get very angry about it and, you know, hateful words are actually said and propaganda actually promoted as well. So, I, yeah, I, I, I think it's actually a very, very fraught area when mm -hmm. you try and legislate and create laws on um, uh, this particular issue. And I think, you know, um, I think for a start, I mean, you know, we need to look at these entities like Broadcasting Standards, the Media Council and the Classification Office. Um, maybe, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably not um, telling you what you don't already know, but we need to rethink so that it actually becomes um, an entity that is actually a uh, platform agnostic and it has to be about hateful um, um, content, hurtful content, harmful content uh, that actually hurts. And I should, I should, um, um, I was going to swear just then. Um, I, I, I should hope that it's actually not going to cancel people's um, thoughts, freedom of speech. And I'm a, you know, great supporter of freedom of speech. I think it is a democracy and we need to respect that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, one of the things in the in the review is that the um, what we heard. I went to some of the early sessions on it. One of the early sessions on it, and they talked about um, one of the things. One of the one of the harms they were trying to deal with deal, deal with was public processes and institutions losing the trust and confidence of society, and the idea that the idea that you can actually sort of do regulation around that worries me. Um, because I mean, let's face it. Sometimes public processes and institutions lose our trust and faith because they're doing badly. Um, and they deserve to lose the trust and faith. And I think that that is aimed at the whole misinformation and disinformation. But I'm very reluctant to have the idea of um, of the government saying this is the right view and this is the wrong view. I mean, misinformation, it's a fancy word, but it just means being wrong, mm. really. Mm. Um, and, and we know that things change. I mean, one of the striking examples in just in the last month, of course, has been that it's, if you live in Russia, it's misinformation to talk about the invasion of uh, Ukraine. It's misinformation to talk, talk about anything but the the Nazification of the of uh, Ukraine, um, and that's obviously the rest of the world that looks ludicrous. But that's what's happening there. Mm. So you can see how the term it can be very easily abused by by uh, by governments. Well, and, and that's exactly right, Thomas. You know, uh, certainly the Free Speech Union, the Council for Civil Liberties, the, the National Party, none of us are free speech absolutists. None of us say <laughs> anyone should have the right to say anything anytime, right? That's not what free speech is about. Um, we, we all accept that there are legitimate limitations on this very fundamental right. But we say that as a caveat to the fact that it is a fundamental right. And once we start playing around with that, we really have to have an end in mind and an understanding of how we get to a very specific place. And, and I'm concerned at the, the vague nature. Uh, you, you, you talk about um, the, the case of Russia at the moment, and, and that's apt, aptly uh, contributed. But, but I mean, e even in other places, uh, the, the lab leak theory, uh, that, that the, this notion that we couldn't talk about um, COVID-19 
having come out of a, a scientific lab in China for some time, that was misinformation. That was that was uh, fake news. And yet now it's a, a very um, entertained idea. And and yet and now it's going even to another point where it's gone through another iteration of of consideration and is no longer considered. But that's what happens when we allow discussion. Uh, and the other is, of course, um, comments around masks and and COVID nineteen. Now it's not to it's not in any way to point at you know scientists who said masks won't be appropriate and go look they got it wrong it's to say isn't this how conversations work it moves us forward it actually helps propel uh, our understanding and our knowledge going forward i i think um it, it would be really interesting to unpack i guess this concept of misinformation is there a way that we can practically with a public policy lens div uh, distinguish between someone just being wrong and and that just being an opinion and someone being factually wrong when so often we can't even agree on the same terms. So, Melissa, what do you think, you know, in terms of, of vaccine status? Uh, you know, it, it's one with all of us and the vast majority of New Zealand would say the science is settled on this. Um, should we be uh, saying this is what it is said and remove information that is incorrect scientifically? Or do we do we threaten that conversation at that point? Where, where's the balance in that? Well, I think the problem that we have is that as, you know, um, as Thomas had actually said, is actually about trusted information and where people are supposed to go to um, to find the details of information, whether it is actually vaccination or mask wearing or whatever. And, you know, and because when you consider the fact that, you know, when I was a journalist, which is a few moons ago, <laughs> uh, facts were facts and journos were journos. Uh, you didn't actually have journos opining about, you know, their own views on mm -hmm. a certain topic. Whereas if you open up the New Zealand Herald, then you would actually find that there they were probably a lot more opinion columns than, you know, news per se sometimes. And the, uh, the landscape in terms of the media landscape is actually changing very, very fast, I guess, you know, uh, because of technology. I'm not blaming technology, but I think we need to be really be mindful um, and people need to understand what is in fact news and what is an opinion. And it, those lines are actually blurred sometimes. And I think when you when Thomas talked about trust, I think, you know, was it I think it was AUT Center for Journalism. Um, um, and democ journalism, media and democracy. And I think going back to 2020, and they did a survey and found that um, the trust in media was in fact slipping, that Kiwis trusted um, uh, news only 48%. Um, and I think something like 60% or was 60 something percent trusted news in the outlets that they, ch uh, they actually chose to access. So in a way, I mean, you know, they chose to they choose to access a particular news media and yet they only trust it like 60%. So it's almost mm -hmm. like they mistrust their own echo chamber. So I, I think it's really, really important uh, to um, establish trusted media. And, you know, even politicians, I mean, I think we're at the bottom of the pile together with, you know, real estate agents for people, you know, uh, who are actually people don't trust, right? Uh, which is really sad, but you know, I, I should hope that um, we we actually um, find a way so that people get the right information, and that, mm. for example, should be the government. And I'm not so sure if the government has actually helped that uh, mm. trust factor mm. either. I'd like yeah, to address yeah. well, I'd like to address one of the points there, which is that this is one of my concerns with this review of content regulation. It lists all these harms, but if you've got something called the review of content regulation, the obvious solution is regulation. Um, whereas in reality, disinformation is probably a very bad one to deal with by regulation. There are many other ways to do it. Um, and one of the ways is the way that Melinda was just mentioning. I mean, uh, the, the government did a, a reasonable job of getting accurate data information about COVID out there. Um, and there's actually room for doing more of that as well. I think we're going to get onto that later. You can talk about when you know, the media merges and public journalism funds and all the rest. But you know, there are many other ways. Could be, I mean, I think we can recognise and agree that misinformation and disinformation can be harmful and can be a problem in our society without having to say, okay, the answer therefore is to pass a law and set up an authority and make some rules and, and find some people. I think that's a, a huge leap there, which this, this review may not be taking into account enough. So uh, government absolutely. creating another bureaucracy once again, back room, <laughs> spending money on it. They seem Possibly. to do quite a lot of that. <laughs> 
but, but uh, Thomas, I think if I'm hearing you right, what you're saying there is censorship is not always the most effective response to what is objectively harmful or objectively incorrect information. And and I think uh, it, it, it's the go to, isn't it? Uh, across across history and across regimes, uh, censorship to simply stop communication that is um, inconducive to societal well-being is, is what we, where we've gone. But actually through that, we've discovered it's often a very blunt instrument to achieve the, the ends we have. Have in mind and and i think uh melissa what you're saying there around um uh, trust in authorities and, and trust in the information that we're receiving you know we're running uh this series across the next five weeks uh to address that in some ways to try and unpack w- what is censorship in this country what sort of authorities are overviewing that and we've got the the chief censor joining us we've got a number of different uh, lecturers and authorities and, and 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 people coming and saying look actually we have a regime here that is doing its best and and that's certainly not to say it's perfect as the free speech union uh we we certainly do not think it's perfect but hopefully we can uh promote understanding around it and through that build more confidence but i think the comments you're making there form a perfect segue into uh exactly what you're saying there thomas the 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 combination of um of public broadcasting and even uh, publicly owned commercial broadcasting, which we see in Radio New Zealand and and TVNZ, uh, the Minister of Broadcasting, Chris Farfoy, also the Minister of Justice, uh, announced uh, 10 days or so ago that uh, they would actually be merged together. And this has um, some really major implications for free speech, and we'll unpack those a little bit, but at the moment, the Free Speech Union is running a petition uh, to Minister Farfoy, uh, calling on him to ensure that from the outset, uh, this merger has free speech built into its foundations, because without free speech, uh, as we're discussing here, uh, we won't be able to have confidence and, 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 and trust in the accuracy of what's being presented. Free speech enables counter perspectives, and, and we, we uh, realize what the authority is as it comes through that. Um, we need to see Farfoy I think actually build this in from the start and not window dress at the end uh, and and it's it's uh, doesn't seem like that's necessarily going to be the case at this stage but we've included the link to that petition in the comments uh, just below so if you want to sign that please do a uh, call on Farfoy to ensure that free speech is included but Thomas I wonder if we, you can start with you um what is the the position of the, the the Council of Civil Liberties on this merger do you think that there are some dangers uh, in in the merger for civil liberties for Kiwis um, I, to be honest, I don't think there's actually that much danger in it. I don't want to see a biased, um, you know, it is going to be a big media player. I'd hate to see it being biased. And I think it's very important, you know, what they put in this charter and the structures they put to control it so it doesn't become a government mouthpiece. But at the same time, um, I think there's actually the whole, because the media world has exploded, because you can get your views from wherever you like and so on, the dominance of those players, I don't think it's that strong as it was. Um, and therefore, I'm not personally, I'm not really seeing it as a big threat. That's interesting. Mel- Melissa, I think National has taken quite a strong stand on this, haven't they? Uh, We certainly are, and I've been quite a a strong uh, opponent of the merger. I guess one of the reasons is because I don't see what the problem is, and it looks like the minister has actually come up with a solution and decided to create a problem. And it's a very expensive one at that. And when you have a cost of living crisis where people are having difficulty paying for petrol and paying rents and what have you, I, I can't imagine why we would spend millions and millions of dollars and that this merging of two entities uh, supposedly the minister is actually a champion of plurality of media um, and plurality of voices in the media. And yet when you merge two entities, I mean, is it really increasing the plurality or is it reducing it? I mean, I can imagine job cuts at Radio New Zealand and TVNZ when they're merged. And, you know, I, I, I have no idea how they c- could merge two entities so different like RNZ and TVNZ. It's like mixing, you know, oil with water you know, chalk and cheese, all, all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm just not sure. I mean, they've already spent more than $5 million uh, in the last two years um, with all of the consultants um, and working groups and what have you. And they're, you know, getting up to the establishment board even before the two entities are merged and creating a new public media entity. They're going to spend another four, $14.8 million, I think it's $14.8 million. I mean... 
if they put it into content, I would have I would have welcomed it. I mean, you know, um, New Zealand local content producers are crying out for more money so they could actually, you know, produce local content. And if we want to be um, a, you know, contender in the world market, we need to actually strengthen our content creators. And by reducing the outlet to one entity, I'm not so sure if it is actually doing us um, um, any service and certainly, you know, providing a disservice to the public as well. And, you know, and I think Thomas, you actually mentioned the bias. I mean, I don't want bias either. And, you know, which way is it going to go? Is it go the Radio New Zealand way or is it going to be the more commercial TVNZ way? And when TVNZ, you know, has... Um, more than $300 million that they actually, you know, um, gathered from commercial um, advertising um, for TVNZ. And if now the government says, oh, you don't actually have the mandate to return a profit for the crown. And so, and you, we will reduce your commercial activities a little bit. Does that mean that taxpayers are in fact going to fork out a heck of a lot more money for TVNZ to operate without commercials? So does that mean that if you reduce, you know, 50% of their commercial enterprise, does that mean that the taxpayers are going to foot $150 million to the new entity at, you know, together with RNZ on top of RNZ's costs? I'm not so sure. I just think, you know, um, there are far better um, choices for the government to pick on to actually spend the millions, I think, at this stage. I don't think Radio New Zealand and TVNZ are broken. You know, one of the um, the comments that the uh, chief executive of Radio New Zealand made when uh, he was interviewed on this merger was that uh, this has come in parts, quote, by the spread of disinformation. So it's it's taking us back to this uh, former conversation and and the really nebulous subject as we've unpacked that uh, that disinformation is. And and from our perspective, no society has ever been served well by any organisation uh, claiming to have a monopoly on truth, and, and that would be the case for whether it was uh, the church or a government or, or any individual institution, we have to allow exactly as you were saying, Thomas, uh, for that uh, plurality of debates. Um, Melissa, you were a broadcaster. We've, we've discussed that a little bit. Um, I wonder what were some of the ways that you went about making sure that you allowed for that that uh, diversity of opinion for those various perspectives to be considered. I'm sure many of them you didn't agree with, uh, but that that doesn't mean you automatically jump to them being misinformation. As a broadcaster, how did you navigate that? I think you know I, I did a very specific television program called Asia Down Under, and um, you know I, I'm old school journalist um, going back many decades. I mean I began my career in New Zealand um, news media going back to 19, 1980 something. <laughs> I'm showing my age. Um, and I think back then, you know, we always actually said, you know, when you have a, a, a topic, an issue, you always get somebody who actually speaks for it and somebody who actually speaks against it. You actually allow the readers and the viewers to make make a, a decision as to what the truth is. And actually there, in, you know, somewhere in, in between therein lies the truth, right? And I think when we were doing, when I was producing Asia Down Under, always, you know, I always made sure um, that um, the journos um, bias or, you know, uh, opinions that are actually not included in the story, imported into the story, you know, they are a vehicle for the story to be told. And I think it is actually up, you, I had to make sure that it was left up to the viewer to actually decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. And we actually tried very, very hard. And I think, you know, having won the New Zealand Media Peace Awards, uh, won an you know, international documentary awards, I think one of the biggest compliment I ever got was that if um, one, the fact that I produced it, you know, fairly cheap, uh, even with a trip to Hong Kong and India, uh, it, it was way cheaper than any other broadcaster would have actually produced it, as well as the fact that, you know, if it was produced by a more mainstream media, uh, uh, it would have been um, skewed very differently. Um, give you an example. We had a story about a New Zealand born um, Indian girl. Um, so very Kiwi. Uh, and very traditional parents who wanted to take her back to India, uh, and she thought she was uh, meeting someone, but effectively she got married. And when she came back to New Zealand, cut the long story short, she did refused to have anything to do with it. And we unpack that cultural, um, you know, issue, generational gap, that controversy in in a family. And I think we were very respectful to the uh, to the daughter as well as the parents. And when we when I uh, completed the edit, we actually brought the family together who weren't actually talking to each other, and they all cried. 
and they actually said it was done really really respectfully oh. and it gave both sides the uh op you know opportunity to um say their bit and you know they they respected that mm -hmm. i thought that was the biggest compliment that i got and i think as a journalist i should be very proud of that work Mm, mm. Thomas, Melissa said before that she didn't know what the problem was uh, that the minister is trying to fix here, and 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 yet we have the um, the chair, uh, the the chief executive, excuse me, of of RNZ coming down saying that disinformation is a component of of the issue that has been addressed here. Do you think it's uh, legitimate, and do you think it will be helpful for RNZ to have that in mind as it goes into this merger with TVNZ? You said before. Oh, I'd actually, I'd actually hope that all, that's all, all media wouldn't want to be sharing disinformation they want to be just sharing true true information so i think we're safe on that one but i think we're putting it in the context of i mean we've talked about the changing media thing but of course one of the big things about is that the big media companies have seen a lot of money leave that um, sector it's shrunk a lot because of advertising has gone elsewhere um, and we've relied on and we're becoming increasingly aware that i think our democracy does actually rely on uh competing uh, you know strong and competing news sources um, in terms of partly to actually enable that debate. Uh, we talked about before about uh, disinformation. I mean, we've always, in the past, we have had a consensual view of reality, which has been mm. sort of, everyone kind of agrees on and they can debate around the edges. But even in the, um, uh, the early 90s, for example, uh, we did have alternative media, but it was much smaller. I mean, if you wanted to get an alternative leftist view of the world, you had to pick up a copy of the uh, militant newspaper from the local um, uni, for example, and you get a view of sort of you know, America's evils and the foreign, foreign, foreign affairs and so on. So we're talking about this thing where um, we do need, I believe we do need stronger media. Um, I do believe that we need stronger media with a commitment to accuracy. Whether this is a good way of doing it, I don't really have a strong opinion on, but um, I, they might be going the right way, they might be going the wrong way. Do you think uh, it, it is possible for a diversity of opinion to exist within this merger? Uh, you know, we, we saw in the spinoff uh, last week, uh, Duncan Grieve kind of outline in, in similar uh, language to, to what Melissa was saying there, where, where you remove the commercial motivation or, and you try and meld that with, a, with another organization that has no commercial um, uh, motivation. H how, how do they navigate that? Uh, do you think that we are going to see a reduction in a diversity of perspective naturally by two organizations becoming one or do you think there's a way to to navigate that that actually fosters that debate internally well i think there is obviously ways you can do that whether they will do that is another point and that's all that's what we don't know at the moment uh, that's what i'd like to do but at the same time i said there is actually enough other diversity of opinion out there there are we have seen a flourishing of small media com com companies and of course we do have that huge um, Facebook, WhatsApp, Telegram, YouTube, podcasting world, which is, you know, we can go and get our own media, however we like. And I think that the, the ability for one or two places to actually dominate is, um, is, has dropped away a lot. And, and I want to unpack that a little bit because, because you, you, of course, you're right. Uh, through the uh, wonder that is the World Wide Web, um, really, we can access uh, whatever sort of information we want. But but that's not really speaking to kind of where we started with this. It's speaking to uh, information that we find trustworthy and that we can all accept. And that, in a way, um, while you say, well, this merger may occur, um, they may have diversity of opinion, they may not. But at a certain level, you can get diversity of opinion elsewhere. Is that not part of the problem, though, where we go, well, look, this is a government funded entity, it's receiving an enormous amount of money, and I don't trust it. So I'm going to go to one of these other alternative perspectives. And that actually fosters this increasing polarization. Do you think it, it, it contributes to this um, perspective that the government isn't working in the interest of the people, which is something, unfortunately, we see emerging amongst some groups? Well, I, I I mean, what's your alternative? How are you going to stop people going somewhere else? I mean, it's kind of like a, I mean, it's an interesting question. It's definitely worth speaking about and so on, but, mm. you know, the genie is out of the bottle. 
<laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and from the perspective of free speech, I would say um, th th this, how do we stop people from going somewhere else? It's not a problem. We're very happy for people to go somewhere else. But I guess the motivation is, is the really important uh, aspect. Why are people feeling like they have to go somewhere else? And in creating this entity, this uh, media behemoth that is, that is publicly funded, are we actually paying for the problem that, that we're then creating? Melissa, what do you think? I, I think, you know, the whole concept of media behemoth that you actually talked about, I mean, you know, the government is actually spend going to be spending a lot of millions to actually create an entity. And as you know, we all discuss, we don't have too much detail as to what shape mm. that is going to take. And any difficult questions um, that are actually put to the minister, he would potentially actually say, well, we don't actually deal with content or you know, whatever happens in the entity, it is actually up to the entity. Well, the entity hasn't been created. Uh, the establishment board hasn't been established yet. Uh, yeah, it's just gonna be spending lots of money. But I think the interesting thing about you know, our people, why are people moving, uh, elsewhere to get the content that they actually want in terms of diversity. Give you one example, ethnic communities. I'll give you my mother. My mother, you know, elderly lady, speaks good English, but she never actually feels comfortable watching the news in English. So she has to revert to the Korean language and there isn't a Korean language news available in New Zealand. So she literally goes to the Korean uh, sites uh, or the local Korean media uh, uh, news outfit that they've got a local version once every day and, and she will actually tune into that to get her local Korean news and it will be the same for many other ethnic communities because they get it in their own language and with the you know with technology now they can actually do that whereas traditionally people relied on the six o'clock news every day they plopped themselves in front of the tv watch linear television they, they no longer need to do that I mean I don't watch the news I actually oh, you know on tv I actually watch it on my phone because I'm rushing around and what, you know, I pick and choose what I actually want to watch. And that's the option that people have. And I think it's actually a good thing. Advancement in technology means that, you know, you don't need to sit and wait and, you know, watch all of the advertising either. You can do other things, but going back to the whole thing about plurality, I mean, the ministry of culture and heritage commission, this is government, you know, government department ministry actually commissioned a report it's called a Sapiri report. And it actually says, and I quote, it is not a compelling case for a structural intervention by the government to address the potential future risk of plurality in national news. And that the government spent, I mean, you know, they've spent more than $300 million on media. I mean, you know, uh, uh, earlier uh, Thomas actually said, you know, they've lost a lot of money. Yeah, government's actually, you know, subbed that with $300 million spent um, on broadcasting last year. And, you know, and, the Sapere report also says that the New Zealanders are currently well served by plurality in media, and we have more choices than ever before about the type of content that they actually consume. And one of the criticisms that I've actually heard from, um, you know, some people watching New Zealand news is that we don't have too many news about overseas events. And they actually want to know, you know, in the context of the world, in you know, a global citizen, what's happening around the world. We don't have too many of those uh, news, even local news, regional news. We don't actually have that. So I think, you know, when, when you have content that is coming out and Thomas said, you know, smaller media uh, organizations are doing different things. And I think it's actually great. People can choose what they want to watch, but when you actually create a giant entity, like, you know, the merged uh, radio, New Zealand TV NZ, it's just going to be that big, competition to the commercial media outfits that are out there and the, it, it will just basically squash them and it'll be taxpayer funded to do so and going back to that trust model people are going to look there people already know this is going to be a mouthpiece for the government well i don't and know that's, i mean that, whether whether that is true or not but that is the image that they have because they're going to be taxpayer funded it's government money and you know it's going to be the mouth. So, so there's there's this this perspective of it there, and and of course uh, leaders in the space always have to have a view to uh, the the actual safeguards, and then the perception of the safeguards as well to to do no harm, but also to be seen to be doing no harm. Thomas, from your perspective as the chairperson uh, for the Council of Civil Liberties, what would it look like for uh, for the government to ensure that safeguards are meaningfully put in place that would uh, preserve plural 
plurality in an organization like this? You, what sort of uh, tools do they have at their disposal? Is it is it the charter? Is it legislation? How do they navigate that? Well, I'm not a media expert or a media business expert, but I mean, obviously the charter is going to be critical, uh, I think. And the way they do their, they structure their board and how the command flows down and also how the money flows. Because of course, as we all know, this sort of government interference or government bias is often subtle. It's not an order coming down saying you must do this. It's more like funding happens to flow where, where it's, sort of, it's more sort of seen like a good idea maybe. So we have to make sure that's independent somehow. And I believe that that's actually possible to do with, with a, the right board and the right charter and so on. Um, it's partly, as you say, the commitment of the government to doing that. Um, they've said there's going to be a char charter. They've said it's going to be important. They haven't told us much about what's in it. I'd like to hear. Well, I'd like. I'd like to hear more about that from them. Yeah, uh, me too. But I'm going to have to disagree with Thomas. I mean, TVNZ used to actually have a charter. It never did anything. Radio New Zealand has a charter. When you actually hear submissions, you know, from people when they're when Radio New Zealand is supposed to be catering for New Zealand wide, the diversity. Where is the ethnic content on Radio New Zealand? Where is the disability uh, accessibility on Radio New Zealand content? You know, you, you sort of have to go, okay, well, you know, why is Radio New Zealand competing with commercial media? It's supposed to be public service radio. I, I, I guess it just doesn't actually fix the problem, I don't think. We're, we're, we're straying slightly from uh, from free speech here, though. But uh, but I guess the counter response to that, Melissa, would be um, because these are minorities, the market forces won't provide for them either. So there, there has to be a committed government response to, to enabling this. And, and imperfect though it may be, they, they, they have a role to play there. Do you think that's a fair response? I, I think so. I, I think, you know, when, I mean, one of the reasons why New Zealand On Air was actually set up was to actually, create you know, give local content uh, an airing on our broadcasting, right? Whether it's actually radio or television or uh, our music. And so if it was going to be successful and have lots of viewership in the, in the marketplace, I mean, it will just go to a commercial television station. But, you know, the reason why it actually goes to is that, you know, sometimes it's actually not just the eyeballs that actually watch TV. It's actually about the content and the value to our culture and our, our diversity as a nation. I think there are, you know, stories that really needs to be told and which may not be necessarily commercial success. You know, like the stuff that I actually did with Asia Down Under. I mean, sometimes people say, oh, but you used to get New Zealand on air, you know, money and you're actually talking about, you know, uh, not funding um, um, certain things because it doesn't rate. Well, uh, when you actually want to uh, make crap television, <laughs> I think we need to actually sort of have a look at how much money government's actually putting into that. But, you know, when you have cultural contents uh, of New Zealand's population or historically significant events that we actually want to tell the stories of, I think, you know, if commercial entities are not going to be funding it, I think government should through New Zealand on air. Well, one, of the interesting, yeah, one of the interesting things I've got is I'm actually a bit old fashioned. I get the local daily paper every day. Well, I was um, just about to ask and, you, do I yeah, really it, subscribe yeah. to papers? Yeah, no, I, I do. do. And it's I interesting, do. though, because what's happened over the last few years is they've actually started including more and more uh, information about the local uh, body bodies, you know, the councils and so on. We've got a few councils here who have got some problems, maybe. And it's actually a lot of that is actually, has actually been funded by the government through the, uh, through the journalism fund. Um, and, you know, I think that's an example of maybe where the government is doing well, because it's sort of the sort of stuff which isn't maybe sexy and selling papers mm -hmm. but i think it is actually valuable and it's part of that sort of you know the paper of record and so i think it's actually that's actually a really good counter to i don't know to disinformation it's a mm -hmm. and misinformation it actually provides a service and it is actually a way of doing it in a way i don't think anyone's well i don't think anyone serious has suggested that this money that's spending on on covering local councils is actually distorting or mm -hmm. um you know, biased or anything so i think you know, that's a possibly an example of way uh, somewhere where it is working well yeah, the local democracy reporting is something that I, I, I actually uh, championed and actually supported, and I think it works really, really well. I think about Public Interest Journalism Fund, which is actually a greater pot of money, I'm not so sure if it's actually achieved what it's meant to achieve, because it actually excluded certain sectors who do not agree onto a certain political um, uh, uh, um, leaning. So, you know, why is it that only Maori and um, our Pacifica community can report on political issues, whereas, you know, ethnic, ethnic Asian media are not allowed to and that seems a bit strange to me so you know there there is a, a bit of bias on that one um and i think you know if, if you're gonna it's it's got to be fair and i you know if the funding is fair right across the board i don't have a problem with it 
Um, the one thing that's really interesting is um, I think when you, you actually asked, you actually, Thomas actually said he likes getting the newspaper. So do I. Do you like the texture of the, you know, <laughs> the pans getting really, really filthy? I still, I'm quite tactile, I think. I still love turning the pages on a newspaper. Nothing better well, than What that. do you light your fires with in winter if you don't get a newspaper? <laughs> Or packing when you're yeah. moving. <laughs> and, and you, five years ago, um, Fairfax Media, which at the time owned Stuff and uh, NZME, looked to merge. And it was actually a merger that was blocked by the Commerce Commission. And uh, that decision was uh, taken to court. And, and the High Court claimed on all the evidence before the commission, we consider it is appropriate to attribute material importance to maintaining media plurality. It can claim status as a fundamental value in a modern democratic society. We agree with the commission that a substantial loss of media pl plurality would be virtually irreplaceable. And once they ruled on that, it was taken to an appeal court and the appeal court again agreed with the high court agreeing with the Commerce Commission saying uh, that this marketplace of ideas justification recognizes that the community benefits from a variety of perspectives and from allowing people to participate in the community by expressing those views. Plurality lose losses are also very likely and substantial. So I guess that was the key concern that they identified there. And again, this is what we're discussing here. Without plurality, without uh, those, those competing perspectives that aren't dictating what is being said, but simply that a variety of opinions are allowed to be stated are really crucial. And so I'm sure um, for both organizations, uh, other than the FSU represented here, this is the key interest that we have in mind. And as the Free Speech Union, what we will continue to work towards is not uh, one perspective being put forward. Uh, our council is made up of such a variety of perspectives we could never agree on that but simply that uh, free speech is preserved and and those diverse perspectives are represented in in line of of those uh diverse perspectives i want to take us to a third conversation tonight and we're we're getting along in the hour so we'll we'll have to move quickly but uh last week the um australian communications and media authority uh saw new laws passed which uh, forced internet companies to share how they would handle uh misinformation data the acma the australian communications and media authority uh, will also be able to enforce an internet industry code on uncooperative platforms. Uh, the Communications Minister Paul Fletcher said in a statement, digital communication platforms must take responsibility for what is on their sites and take action when harmful or misleading content appears. And again, uh, we, we enter into the very vague terms that are, that are particularly common at the moment, harmful. What does that mean? Uh, does that mean it's simply something that disagrees with me because at times I, I feel like I'm attacked when uh, people disagree with me or misleading. Uh, misleading isn't disinformation, it's not intentional, but how do we how do we uh, consider that? And really, we're getting into a technical subject there. Next week, I will be sitting down with uh, Dr. David Brommel, who has just uh, released a book uh, called Regulation of Free Speech in a Digital Age from the Victoria University. But in that, he uh, kind of talks about the differences between operating as a platform and operating as a publisher. When you're a publisher, you're responsible for the material that has been put out. When you're a platform, it is simply something that other people take responsibility for within uh, your framework. And what we're seeing here are major networks like uh, like Facebook or Twitter being considered publishers instead of platforms, being considered responsible for uh, that material. Thomas, in your mind, do you agree it's true that platforms must take responsibility for what is on their sites? Do you think they should be held accountable as publishers of this material? Publishers are very specific terms, so I'm going to leave that one alone. But in general, I believe that they have, Twitter and Facebook and others, have tried to set themselves up as being the digital commons, where we all come together. They want to dominate that market. And, so on. and I believe that as part of that, they take on respons responsibilities with that. Um, they have to take a responsibility for that because as their size gets bigger and bigger, they must act properly. But at the same time, I feel that they, the way we're trying to get them to do things, I think we're going about it wrong. Mm. Uh, I think we're making expectations of them which don't really work. And um, the other problem with this is, of course, is that, is that we talk about um, the famous line is that the censorship, uh, the internet inter interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. If people do 
to control those big media platforms, they're going to go el elsewhere. And the point is, is that censorship really on the internet really doesn't work as well as people think it should. Um, the whole global nature of it. I mean, we saw that after the uh, after the Christchurch massacre, where a number of small websites overseas looked at the New Zealand government orders saying take this material down and said no. Um, and that material is always available. But coming back to the point of the digital commons and so on, I believe we are going to see, we are actually working towards replicating what we had in the past. And that is the idea that of the big media, which is which used to be the news, news, newspapers and radio stations, and it's now Twitter and Facebook, we're going to hold them to some sort of set of principles and we're going to hold them against those principles. And everyone else, we're just going to have to let them do what they want. So do you think uh, that was going to be a question I want to raise? It's uh, do you, do you think there is something to be said for these these and these are really are the behemoths, the the, the Twitters and the Facebooks uh, that that have an ordinance uh, influence in our lives and the information and communication we come across. Do you think that they have effectively signed up to a higher standard than your your telegrams or your twitches or these other far more insignificant players that that really people go to because they know it's the wild west i think they have um and i think they're gonna they're gonna be finding out they're already finding that out um, the christchurch call and so on uh, yeah. points it out and they'll be making moves the problem here is that the standards they want to impose are not always the standards we want to impose um, so having standards which are culturally appropriate is highly important uh, for example, I, I administer a small Facebook group and someone recently got kicked out automatically because they referred to running their kids down to the pool. And uh, Facebook interpreted that as being a violent threat to run over people and kick them out and, and, and remove that entry. Um, it's, it's culturally ignorant. So, and there's also no appeal as well. So at the same time we say that they're taking on responsibilities, they've also got responsibility to do it fairly. I mean, one of the things we always say is that if you are going to limit people's behavior, if you can justify it in terms of civil liberties and freedoms and so on, you've got to provide proper ways of doing it. You've got to provide a way of appealing a decision and be able to get you know, justification for it. And they do terribly at that. Yeah. Um, so what I'm thinking we're looking at seeing, oh, sorry, let's quickly finish off, is that I think in the long run, we're going to end up with, because we can also, like, we can't force Facebook to do anything anyway, we're, we're too small. We're going to end up with the countries like us setting common standards which we're going to impose on those people, but then those standards are going to, they're going to be principles, and then we're going to have local enforcement, and they're going to choose how to, how to no, we're going to set those principles, they're going to choose how to, how to make those principles work, and we're going to then hold them to it mm. on a local basis. Mm. Um, Melissa, as, as a, um, an individual who receives her paycheck because of the will of the people, if I can put it that way, you, you are, you're employed to represent constituents uh, in, in Auckland. Uh, and, and, and that is, it's an incredible thing. I think we don't uh, reflect on that frequently enough, um, that we live in a country where we do have a representative democracy with its faults that does work uh, quite well. Um, how, how do you think we navigate this where a key we citizens voice on what should and shouldn't be considered harmful, uh, what is uh, culturally sensitive or insensitive material finds representation at these really high levels. It's a real problem that Facebook can now simply kick people out, um, remove them from a very significant portion of, of uh, public digital life now, uh, simply by standards that they set, that we have no recourse to really uh, mediate uh, and we, ha we have no representation to actually consider our, uh, our perspectives before. How do you think we need to ensure that Kiwis have a voice in that? I think uh, when you have representatives like myself who understands this issue personally, I, I have had one of my videos actually deleted from YouTube um, because of an upskirt. Uh, it was part of an Asia Down Under program uh, of a um, dance um, ballroom dancing that actually happened and because it happened to be the junior um, uh, ballroom dance and the skirt went up, uh, up skirt apparently it was not, uh, ex you know, acceptable to YouTube. Explicit and they, material. Exactly. And they actually deleted it. Uh, and that was rated G and shown on a Sunday morning at 8.30. And it was rated by the TVNZ um, uh, classification. Um, and, you know, it was for general viewing. It was, you know, in the context of a dance. 
and it was a twirl and the skirt went up and it, it got deleted. So I think, you know, um, I, I speak regularly to Facebook and all of the uh, different platforms. And I think having that kind of conversation is really, really important because a lot of those um, deletions and um, cancellations happen um, not by a person sitting in front of the computer going delete, delete, delete. It's often, you know, uh, an algorithm or, you know, a, a bot that actually does it. So when they don't understand the cultural context uh, of the vernacular, like what, you know, Thomas actually, um, you know, said about running the kids down um, to the pool or, you know, for sport or whatever, or the dance class. And I think, you know, when they don't understand the cultural context of our language, uh, you have that problem. And I think we need to um, alert these, um, you know, platforms to that to, so that they learn that we have our own culture. I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, really worries me, I guess, you know, in this particular topic is that we need to be aware of these uh, platforms existence, but they also bring value in terms of I know the media, the ComCom is actually currently looking at the, um, the uh, considering the um, the competitive bargaining issue with media uh, trying to actually bargain with the entity so that they will actually pay for the content sharing. But the thing is that a lot of the contents are shared by us, not those platforms. And, you know, uh, I might actually share, let's say, a Herald story, which I thought was really fantastic about a local hero or something. You know, am I sharing it or is it the platform that's sharing it and the platform having to pay for that particular content? And I think when, you know, Google's actually uh, Google search bring eyeballs to the websites for the local newspaper. So they do actually benefit for that. And I've always actually stated that if if the platforms are monetizing the local news content by sharing, you know, by sharing the link or for whatever, then they should actually pay for it. And I think the platforms are very willing to pay for those. And when you have, you know, um, um, the the Commerce Commission deciding that the merger of the two, you know, commercial entities like, you know, um, ones that you actually mentioned earlier uh, and we now have an RNZ and TVNZ merger I mean so why is it a government outfit say actually merge the two entities without the worry of plurality I yeah it really does in fact concern me and I think you know when you have the arrogance um, of you know a ministry like Ministry of Arts Cult you know, Ministry of Culture and Heritage who in fact spent money and commissioned an independent report on plurality and they got a report called a superior report which tells them that there is no issue of plurality and that there is no need for a merger and they ignore that advice. I think they're just going down a rabbit hole and, mm. you know, and taxpayers and all of us are actually going to pay for it in the end. Mm. Look, this has been a, a fascinating conversation and, and I appreciate your dexterity uh, for jumping with me from, from one subject <sighs> to another. And I really appreciate uh, your contributions and your time this evening. Thomas, if you will uh, indulge us for one second, Melissa, you know, as the Free Speech Union, we, we reach out to every political party and, and really all individuals of authority representing the case of Kiwi's right to freedom of expression. And so we, uh, we work with as many parliamentarians across the board as possible. But as it is you that we have here this evening, I want to, I want to give you a moment. Look, we've discussed uh, a number of, of aspects that the, the Labour government and Minister Farfoy as the broadcasting minister is undertaking. You, you've outlined what your concerns are and, and where you would oppose them. But what is your vision? Rather than talking in the negative, I wonder if we could just conclude with, with free speech and the rights and duties that we as Kiwis have that in mind. What would you do if next year you are elected as uh, and then appointed as Minister for Broadcasting? What is your vision for how we uphold uh, the decision? dissemination of information and the rights to free speech? Well, I've always been a very strong proponent of local content. And, you know, uh, and I stand by that stand having actually, you know, produced local content in my in my uh, history as a, a journalist, as well as a uh, broadcaster. Uh, but, you know, in terms of um, national, national believes in the plurality of voices um, in the creation of media content, whether it's actually written or entertainment or whatever. And, you know, whether it's actually public or commercial, private, uh, we will commit to supporting the reduction um, of those, um, you know, um, we will actually make sure that we actually reduce government's reach into media. And I think we need to allow media, the fourth estate, 
to take their responsibility and take their duty seriously so that they can actually do what they do best. And regardless of whether we actually criticize them or agree with them or disagree with them, they serve a very, very important role. And I respect that and I support it, whether I actually agree with them or not. And I think, you know, uh, Kiwi innovation is amazing. I mean, we're actually known for it, right? And it, it, is, it is the best asset that we've actually got and we need to strengthen them, you know, um, and make sure that our local stories are actually told in a way that relates to all of New Zealand and not uh, dislocating some sectors that don't, you know, some media actually think that are not necessarily or not needed because I think we all want to be part of New Zealand. We all want to be New Zealanders. We all want to see ourselves on television and radio and actually um, having media that represents all of us is the best way forward. Well, there you go. Hey, look, thank you to our viewers uh, for joining us tonight. And Melissa Lee, uh, MP based up in Auckland, thank you for your time. Thomas Beagle, Chairperson of the uh, Council for Civil Liberties. I do encourage you, uh, the, the, the New Zealand Council for Civil Liberties has a, a far wider remit uh, than the Free Speech Union. And while perhaps free speech um, operates as a foundation for our basic human rights, um, the civil liberties that we enjoy in this country are considerable and vital. And so I encourage you to go and look at the work that they're doing. Uh, while not widely publicized, it is some very important work uh, in targeted places that is really appreciated. And thank you for your time tonight as well. Cheers. Thank you both. Thank you.